the credential of the traveler. And then the issuer seeking to affirm the authority um, that the credential issued and that it can be trusted and it has not been tampered with. Now, how to ensure that trust uh, in the issuance of a digital health pass and the verification of the authenticity of uh, the digital health pass is, is maintained you know, in this value chain. The solution obviously lies in adherence to standards and you know, we don't have them as of today. I mean, we have them, but there is no common standard being adopted, uh, which creates a framework for interoperability that can be incorporated into the existing workflows of travel. And, uh, you know, and, and, and existing workflows that can span boundaries. So we are, we are talking about international boundaries. But if you can achieve this, digital health passes could become one of that missing links, um, you know, in the safe and responsible resumption of uh, international travel, which is obviously what we are all is uh, trying for, but also significantly increase domestic travel um, in countries which have large uh, domestic travel uh, activity. Now, um, so like I said, digital health pass, can it be the missing link? But what is a digital health pass? And you know, just for the benefit of people who may attending this conference who may not be familiar with this, a digital health pass offers a secured digital alternative to paper vaccination cards or test results um, you know, for COVID-19. It uh, provides a very convenient, easy, um, and a voluntary option. This is very important because it is up to the individual, the traveler, that is all of us, to share this credential with a verifier. And the verifier is typically an airline or an airport authority. So it allows individuals to conveniently, number one, manage their COVID credentials, which could be a vaccination or a test. This information is encrypted and resides in a digital health pass wallet, which is sitting on your smartphone. We a digital health pass should typically also support a paper-based record, right? So if you have a paper-based, you don't have a smartphone, um, you have a paper-based record, that's fine. But that paper-based record needs to have a QR code printed on it so that, you know, that can be verified. A digital health pass should give users um, control of what they share, with whom they share, and when they share it. And this data can remain private and completely secure on your device. And then it enables the verifiers, like I said, the airline, the, the check-in counter or the airline staff at the check-in counter, the immigration authorities, um, security, to check the authenticity and the validity of uh, the COVID-19 credential that you're presenting um, while you maintain control of the underlying information. Now, let's look at a typical or a potential traveler journey in COVID times, right? Uh, an, an airline traveler. What you would like to do is number one, be very, be very clear about the rules that you, know, you need to comply to in order to travel from point A to point B. Um, so this wallet that you have uh, should provide you guidance on, on the rules. It should tell you where to get a test done if you need a test. It should be able to import your vaccination credential, which is typically issued at least in Asia Pacific countries by the government, right? So there's a single issuer uh, who will issue a vaccination credential, but on the testing side, there could be multiple providers. So you need a way of bringing that credential into this wallet. Once it's into your wallet and you, know, you are complying with the um, criteria for travel, you should be able to go to the airport, show your credential on your smartphone. Um, the airline, which has a verification app would verify it and through you go. No different from you handing away your passport and the check-in clerk, um, uh, check-in uh, staff uh, validating your identity uh, from your passport, your visa, and allowing you through. But uh, this does not happen due to various reasons. Um, the, 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 the issue that, that often comes up, and you know, that's where a digital health pass needs to have these key features, that it should be able to configure these rules, uh, which are, as I mentioned earlier, are very fluid these days. Um, how do you um, uh, adapt to these rules uh, literally in real time, keep track of these rules, and, and then allow the passenger to kind of comply with the uh, prerequisites of travel? Um, it should be flexible and agile. 
So um, it should be, it should allow not only verification of your credentials, but also backend integration. Let's not forget in the travel case, you have a booking system, you have a check-in system, you may be having, um, um, you know, other systems that, uh, um, that, that need integration and your digital health pass credential um, uh, or, the, or the solution that you choose has to integrate with these backend systems. Uh, it should maintain privacy of your data. We spoke about it. It's your personal health information. You should have complete control on it and you should have the confidence of being able to share what you want with whom you want and when you want it. It should be secure. Um, a digital health pass solution, I mean, like the one we have from IBM, is, uh, is based on a blockchain, a blockchain technology. This ensures that um, you know, there is no single uh, point where this information is stored. Um, and so the operator is not collecting any and storing uh, data in a single location. And the personal uh, health information of the individual is completely in your control. Um, interoperability is very important. If there are no standards and that does do not support interoperability, you'll have a wide array of digital health passes which do not talk to each other. Issuers will issue different credentials. Um, verifiers will not be able to verify it. And we'll have huge uh, bottlenecks uh, you know, at airports. And then finally, uh, be part of a network which allows collaboration uh, with different entities uh, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem. Now, let me delve a little bit deeper into standards and interoperability. Typically, a digital health pass solution will come, will offer an out-of-the-box standards like IBM offers W3C verifiable credentials or decentralized identity, as well as certain ISO standards. But it's very important for um, a digital health pass solution provider to be part of, uh, to, to, to adhere to other uh, standards that are there, uh, like the vaccination credential or smart health card credentials or the um, European Digital uh, COVID Certificate, uh, the DIVOC um, from India, or the Open Attestation in Singapore. And that alone can ensure that these solutions can be part of a larger ecosystem and offer compliance to standards and full interoperability. I'll also delve a little bit deeper into the network comment that I made earlier. It's very important to integrate with not only um, certain types of uh, entities, but we have to um, work very closely with industry bodies, with health authorities, with testing um, uh, providers and uh, you know, vaccine manufacturers, uh, as well as technology partners and verifiers. Um, so that brings me um, you know, to just summarizing you know, what, what we have observed and what we have learned in our various conversations um, around uh, with airlines, with, with airport authorities, with governments on travel recovery with digital health pass. We obviously need a new normal, but try and be as close to what we were used to when we were traveling uh, you know, any, without any issues domestically and internationally. So the user experience is very critical. We want to make it as frictionless as possible. And uh, we need to invest in seamless experience, um, uh, you know, which, which, which offers simplicity, access, accessibility, user friendliness uh, for the traveler. The environment is fluid and I think it will continue being fluid, um, you know, for, uh, for, the, for the near term at least, where you will have changes in uh, travel policies, regulations, and there will still be a time where uh, you know, till we figure out standards and complete interoperability um, of these cr credentials across international borders. Um, every company today has become a healthcare company. And, uh, you know, one of the earlier speakers also said that health is of paramount importance, but it's strange that every company is now uh, viewing uh, their employees and what they do through the uh, lens of health. And that is triggering new engagement models and digital health pass could be the beginning of that journey, um, whether it's the travel sector or it could be other sectors as well. It's very important to maintain flexibility and transparency as a key for adoption. If the travelers do not trust the technology that they are asked to use to support their travel, this will fail. So it's very important to maintain flexibility, transparency um, as a key to adoption. And obviously that is uh, largely done uh, through education, through education of the uh, traveler, uh, the organizations which are going to be verifying those credentials, as well as the governments and providers, they're going to issue those credentials. 
and make sure that this, main, this remains um, a tool which is used to maintain equity, a freedom of choice, at the same time protecting the travelers and all the other people uh, that support the traveler uh, while traveling from point A to B. I'll stop there. I hope I have uh, done justice to the time that was allocated to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandeep, for the very interesting speech. And uh, to see that the, the, about the health pass and all, I mean, this is something new, something very interesting. And I'm sure that uh, this will benefit, will uh, basically uh, benefit all of us uh, in the future. Uh, thank you very much for the very informative uh, speech. And now I would like to call upon uh, Ms. Dr. Roshti. Uh, a very good morning to you in New York. And uh, it is over to you, uh, Dr. Roshti. Okay. Um, uh, thank you uh, and, and, and a, a warm welcome to all our guests and speaker. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor for uh, us to be involved. Um, this uh, very important and a timely event. Uh, so uh, what has been said by uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Christina, uh, by Brother Zedi, by Ms. Sandeep and others are important pieces of the puzzle that we have to be uh, cognizant of. And this um, becomes extremely important as we uh, move forward. Um, on this journey to understand the application of technology in tourism. Um, reference was made to data, but data is just the beginning of the journey. Um, accessing the data is extremely difficult. Um, and then there are privacy issues as raised by Mr. Sandeep. Data needs to be collected, curated, cleansed, and then you basically apply it in the form of information. And the information then becomes knowledge to act upon. So the data just starts the journey. It has a number of milestones that it has to uh, go upon for it to add value in informed decision making. So that's extremely important. Um, Haile, can you do me a favor and put up my presentations? I'm having difficulty here. And we'll, we'll take it from there, please. I don't know why. Um, Haile? I apologize for this. This is the downside of Zoom, um, yes. at least for me. Uh, the challenge is, okay, great. Uh, can you put in presentation mode, please? Thank you. So uh, we talk about technology and when you talk about technology, it's within the jurisdiction of startups, right? The underlying premise of the environment that we are operating in is the shock, which is the COVID-19 pandemic has to accelerate innovation. So we're seeing innovation in edu edutech, online learning, in fintech, in agritech, but what, what about tourism tech? More needs to be done as told by our previous esteemed speakers, but that is part of a story that has to fit into a bigger story. So what I wanted to talk about was the merits of tourism accelerator in Malaysia Either the country will lead or it'll have to follow, right? That becomes extremely important. Next, please. Okay, so uh, let me start off by basically talking about established brands that have ventured into providing uh, accelerator in this space, and then we'll basically walk it into what we're going to talk about. So if you can click highly, uh, about five, so Marriott, Marriott was the latest to launch its own startup accelerator. Next, please. And if you look at the highlight area, it goes to what uh, Ms. Uh, Maria talked about, which was relationship building. Marriott basically included in this accelerator because it wanted to understand the guest experience. And innovation, I guess, react to those becomes extremely important. Next, please. 
And the applicants, with the startups that applied to that accelerator were in concierge service towards activities and trip planning. And then Marriott wanted to get the attention of the tech players. And the last uh, click here on this slide, please. So startups are um, like an endless book. They're going to continue to iterate and disrupt. So this is why Marriott has been involved in this space. Um, so next, next slide, please. If you can click twice and we'll, uh, I'll talk about both of those things. So um, plug and play and um, JetBlue Technology Ventures, the acceptance of technology by startups, by big brand hotels has not been easy. One aspect was um, the amount of incremental revenue that a startup may bring, say $2 million, may be insignificant to a $6 billion enterprise, right? And then there are integration issues with the IT of the existing entities. So the point here is technology is not often welcomed by established players, reason being they think that if it's not broken, what are you going to fix? That may have been pre-COVID. In the COVID and post-COVID, I think the paradigm has shifted where they're more welcoming to technology. And we'll explain, next please. So a tourism accelerator in Malaysia, um, if you can click this. So the UN World Travel Organization and Google basically set up a venture to look into the space of transforming for better tourism planning. And the UAE launched the first tourism accelerator in the region. Singapore has a tourism accelerator and it's supported by these uh, stakeholders. So the point here is we are at the beginning of a potentially new defining era in tourism. Next, please. So what we've done here is uh, last month, we launched the Asian Center for Tourism uh, and Technology. And um, one of the verticals is on industry development. And within that industry development is a tourism accelerator program. The point of talking about this today is, as uh, Mr. Uzaidi mentioned, that innovation uh, can be led by an entity, but in terms of its adoption and traction, it has to be done by collaboration. So the point here is raising the issues of the need for it, and then those who are interested in participating, we will start the dialogue with them. Next, please. Um, yeah, stop right there. So um, startups basically um, are about disrupting the status quo. So we've all heard of fintech and agritech and edutech. Tourism tech is on the lips and now it has to be spoken. Startups can go a number of pathways in terms of their maturing. They can go alone or they can be part of an accelerator and they have to choose the right accelerator. And the accelerator has to choose you also. Uh, YC is one of the most important accelerators in the world. It's based out of uh, California, and it's harder to get into YC than it is to Harvard. And here are the top 10 accelerators in the world. And to the left of it are companies, uh, startups, that have become uh, prominent uh, names, whether it's DoorDash, whether it's um, Instacart, so on and so forth. So the point here is this is an opportunity to basically say the products involving the tourism space that you may have a home in Malaysia and this is uh, an area that is extremely exciting as we move forward in the new normal to bring technology, embrace technology and have technology help in making the user journey, our guests, more safe and feeling confident. Next, please. The area that I wanted to focus in on uh, amongst the areas that startups are trying to address is the carbon footprint of global tourism. This is extremely important. As you can see, um, the tourism travel area is the fourth largest country. If you think of it from a point of view of GDP, there is um, US, China, Japan, and tourism. That's how big it is. And it being that big, it has an externality, externality means um, um, a negative that is associated in the growth of the space. So if you look at the carbon footprint of global tourism from tourism to lodging, and if we focus in on things that we have more uh, in our control, say the hospitality space, hotels, resorts, you see that 20% uh, 
um, of the of it is linked to the hot, uh, lodging, hotels, and dining. What can startups do in this space? Next, please. So yeah, one more. So the role of technology and tourism going forward, um, guests are going to choose uh, destinations based upon their carbon footprint. Because in the area of sustainability and sustainable tourism, ecotourism, green tourism, whatever you want to call it, technology is going to be a participant. Uh, technology is going to lead it. So agriculture, agriculture technology, uh, hotels, resorts, they serve food. What is the food mileage of bring the food from where it is to the hotel? We want to re uh, reduce the carbon footprint by reducing the food mileage. Renewables, um, one of the important areas for this is the energy consumed in AC running hotels. In renewable energy help contribute this uh, to lowering the carbon footprint. Water management, they have beautiful gardens. How is water utilized? Laundry tech, a lot of people do not know that laundry is a big carbon footprint contributor in hotels. So there are startups in this space, packaging and carbon offsets. This is a, a long laundry list. The point here is going forward, this is going to be something that the hospitality and tourism industry must address or those are going to be left behind by those who are addressing it. Next, please. So if we take um, um, attention on the global Islamic economy, $3 trillion, seven verticals. One of the verticals is Muslim lifestyle travel. It's about $200 billion as of now, expected to be $274 billion as of 2024. So it's big, it's growing, but it has a lot of friction in it. And friction was one of the things that were mentioned by our previous speaker from IBM. How can we reduce that friction by way of technology? And I'll explain. Next, please. This is the last slide. Uh, one more clip, please. So the proposed, no, no go back, please. Uh, go back to the last slide. Thank you. So the proposed, um, accelerator that we are having conversations with is going to focus in on certain verticals, such as hospitality and e-learning, fourth industrial revolution technology and hospitality. We spoke about contactless solutions, keys to open up rooms, smart rooms, an area that I just talked about, sustainability, food supply chain, guests and employee safety. There are startups that are involved that are addressing these particular subverticals within the bigger scheme. Typically, these startups should be what we call in the MVP stage, which is minimal vile product, meaning they have customers and monthly recurring revenue. And what we're trying to address are three things in the hospitality uh, and tourism space that technology can actually address, which is friction, leakage, and carbon footprint. So going forward, the new paradigm in tourism is going to be not only about relationship building, but relationship building with technology, which basically enhances the guest's experience in the space that results in loyal customers and those customers become your ambassadors. So, I wanted to thank you for allowing me the privilege to share with you some thoughts on what we're working on. And we hope to work with industry um, on a collaborative basis to make this thing happen, and God willing, uh, next year. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosti. Thank you for the uh, simple and uh, very informative uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we would like to call upon our speaker, uh, Dr. Yi Zing. Dr. Yi Zing, she is from uh, China. And Dr. Yi Zing is the Vice Director for the Institute of Smart Tourism with uh, Hua, Hua Kiao University in China. I hope I got it correct. I'm sorry if I said it wrongly. And uh, let's hear from her something that is very interesting on mobile application tourism. So, Doctor, over to you. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Sari. Uh, um, it's my honor to have this opportunity to share some of my findings in this material reason with you. And your presentation is uh, quite inspiring to me. So personally, I, can I share the slides here? Yes. Okay, thank you. I will try to... Okay. Can you see my PowerPoints? Yes, we see your PowerPoint. Okay. So let's be start with this uh, topic. Actually, this um I would I am invited to share some uh, research findings on the mobile application in tourism. Uh, it is not my current research focus, but it's very. It was very interesting. Uh, I spent two weeks to do some um, data collection and analyze. Um, I will share some of my concepts with you. Okay. Uh, I, so, firstly, uh, because maybe I'm the only one from uh, the Chinese academic institution, so I firstly I would like to share with you how the tourism industry developed with the technology in China over the 30 years, okay? We can see from this chart, um, from the very beginning, the Chinese tourism, uh, both inbound and outbound tourism, the package two will do, uh, what do, uh, dominate it. And we still get information by word at two of mouth. Uh, but recently, with the uh, increasingly uh, number of the mobile phone users, Chinese uh, get used to get information through the mobile phone. So we are uh, indeed need for the accurate recommended travel information and the customized tool become more and more popular. So that is the current situation in China. And here we are. This is the smart tour region from infrastructures uh, from my point of view. So we use the technology like the big data, cloud computing, IoT, actual, and we use it, adopt it to the tourism marketing, tourism management, tourism services, and with the safety and security. And even more because China now is uh, quite focused on the combination of tourism and culture. So we create quite a lot of smart tourism uh, products and the services under the background. And what do we have? We have several smart signal spots. We have smart hotels with a robot with the contactless payment. And we have the online digital museum. We have the digital exhibition. And we still have some customer tourism and the virtual tourism. So that is what customer tourism now in China. And but that is not what I want to share. Actually, I want to share the model or the um, theory um, that maybe uh, from my perspective, I think they will be crucial to the smart tourism that is so-called the value co-creation. Um, you know, we do not, we cannot re, uh, greatly or the, uh, heavily rely on the digital supplier. And it is not just two size uh, communication between a travel operator or the tourist. We need to invite all related stakeholders into the smart tourism, like the digital suppliers, the travel operators, the tourists, and the investment institutions and governments. We join in the circle and we maintain the business information, data, capital, and service flow, flow healthy and safely, uh, like what we mentioned, we keep maintain the personal privacy and we help to maintain the public health. So that is the value co-creation. 
And with this model or with this concept, that is how we create or how we trying to design a new uh, smart tourism apps for the tourists, for consumers. Okay. So here are some cases of smart tourism application in China. Um, actually, I have all these apps installed in my um, Apple's smart Apple phone, but um, let's see with these photos. The first one will be the red tourism in Shanghai. It used the AR and the graphics, the technology. It will create immersed experience of history in the 1920s in Shanghai. And we try to send out the post phone with the QR code to invite the possible tourists to have this AR experience of the historical tourism. And for the second picture or the second uh, movie, that will be a type of the heritage tourism. Uh, I have the app in my smartphone. Can you see with my smartphone? I'm not sure, if, can you see it clearly? So the Chinese government is now paying attention to protect and promote the Chinese uh, cultural heritage access. So some apps trying to rebuild all the dimensional uh, information in these apps and it provides a 3D visualization customer digital uh, cinematic spot. And that is how we call it the digital twin cinematic spot here. And the third case, uh, it is the 5G, 5G plus 4K live streaming uh, cases in Jiu Zai Go. It is a very beautiful natural uh, preservation area. After it was sucked, uh, he, she was sucked from the, earth, um, the disaster of the earthquake. Uh, the local administrative uh, trying to install thousand uh, maybe 3,000 or 5,000 of the camera to um, capture some of the video and we open the live streaming to the world. So it was, it is now the uh, most, one of the most popular tourism site online in China. So this is some cases we have and we have more. Like in our college, we to take an online public opinion supervise on the tourism safety and security because uh, our institution especially um, focused on the tourism safety and risk management. So we do some ranking with the most safe place in China, destination in China. And we try to search online to see the real time display of the popular content with a, geograph a geographically distribution. And since it is a real time data, we can adjust and we can try to make the immediate notification to the uh, local tour guides and to the local uh, tourism administrations. So that is some cases here. And okay, so we back to the tourism mobile applications. To do this research, I take some time and I'll calculate that. And you can see the number here. Um, we can find over 500 apps in Android and system and four, over 400 apps in iPhone system, iOS system. And normally we can divide, the, put these apps into six types. The most popular and the most downloaded type will be the comprehensive service. Okay, so it's my time over. I'm sorry. Wait, please reshare. Um, I'm not sure what happened. It's my time over. No, it's not. Please continue. Okay, so some. I try to. Okay, can you see it again? Yes. Okay, so uh, like the sea trip, uh, the 
uh, my phone wall, and this will be the most popular uh, apps in China. And we still have some transportation and travel advice apps and the whole hotel and homestay reservation apps. And we still have other services because in the process of promoting region, why to reason, quite a number of provinces and cities in China has correspondingly provided a smart way to travel. We call it, uh, you can take only a mobile phone or to travel national wide or region wide. And this is a very classic case with uh, Tencent and the uh, Yunnan Province Corporation result. It is called, you can, you, you can take this mobile phone, you can use this app to travel without the um, currency payments, without uh, any other app's help. And still, so I try to draw the uh, framework with this app. We can see the basis will be the um, information technology we list before and it creates with the true guide service, smart navigation and uh, the routine planning and travel bottle service. And it will help the user, users of the, the potential tourists to plan a tour before he or she decides to go. And in the two, he, can, he or she can easily to identify the crowded situation uh, conditions and the changing charging place and how about the academic information? So that would be a quite smart apps. And um, it's just now maybe one of the most popular tourism apps we can we will use because they inter integrate the information service in the app. However, um, I don't think uh, those apps oh, I introduced, we, we call that is smart. Um, I think the smart tourism apps, they should share, uh, they could have the pattern with the value called creation. I don't know, do I have enough time, but I want to play a video to you. This is an application from a local company, Zhiyou Technology. It is a virtual type of the application. This is our hometown, Xiamen. So you can easily use the app to do that. Yeah, so I will stop there. You can take the voice interpretation and we can do some uh, similar like the Pokemon Go game to do the like AR challenge. And we also use this uh, smartphone to do the AR or VR uh, group photos. And we also have some challenges with the collecting cars. So that is the young generation's favorite uh, kind of things. You spend one day with your smartphone, you can share uh, real time and you can maintain quite a lot of memory and you have the intention to revisit this very specific cinematic spots here. And um, okay, and I will show you uh, how we do this or how this company do this kind of things in tourism app. We call it with the metaverse. Uh, metaverse, it is the two words combination, I think. Uh, it describes that maybe in future people will create a virtual universe that's similar and connected to a real world. So to to um to finish this job, we should do the sign mapping. Seeing designs, uh, but most importantly, you should input some content like the script writing and IP creation. So that is the most important tips here. You need somebody to create the context, but not only the designer. You will invite all the tourists all the operators, the business, everyone in this business, they can create something, okay? So you, we can use the three, D, three dimensional hand paint maps with the local graphical creation. And we do some games in this real community, like the exploration gameplay. And we put, or we add more cultural information, or cultural program here. We have some um, theory play and we can have some 
uh, education pro program for the children, and we will promote the local um, restaurants and the Airbnb, uh, the BNB kind of things. So that is the cinematic rules and guidelines. And we also create some AR gaming fiction tools. We invert, inverse the IP um, image to list our uh, apps and we can do the LPS signal trigger that we will create online celebration punch points. So uh, uh, the, the young generation like to finish some challenge. So we, we create some challenges for them. And eventually we help, we uh, encourage them to collect some regional cultural card. And with the card, card collection game, they can get some rewards and they will try to show the revisit intention to this similar spot. So it won't, it won't be boring if they revisit again because every time they can choose different tasks and different uh, script to play. So that is some smart um, apps I think they can do. And finally they share, sell everything they experience and they have the document to uh, collect their big data. And later this big data it is used for the digital marketing and maybe we can use it for the tourism, um, safety, supervising and other things. Okay. So that is my, my major points. Uh, we believe it is not only the two size things, it is not our tourist to download a mobile application and that is all. We should encourage and include all the parties in this circle into the uh, value co-creation things. So we will invite the content creators, some e-commerce and live streaming service, uh, service businessmen, and we will encourage the business settlement and the assessment. And finally, the big data we create, co-created can be used for an analyzed and for the digital marketing. So can we co-create value for tourism now, romantically, contactless, in cross-culture, or across the generation, or virtually, or innovatively? Um, I think if we sh can open our ecosystem, yes, we can do this kind of things. So that is my major point I want to share with you and hope you can understand my English. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, something very interesting and uh, something that uh, it's very amazing that has been done in China. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I've seen something similar like this in Japan, uh, in one of the uh, uh, documentary that they had, uh, how Japan also has something, but not as advanced as China. Uh, I can share with you that uh, I was involved with uh, a lot of pre-openings of hotels in China uh, when I was working with the Meritus Group in Singapore. And I could see in the early 2000 and right up to mid 2000, the changes in technology that was happening in China. So I think that, uh, what you showed here is something very amazing and uh, very uh, knowledgeable. And uh, thank you very much, doctor, for the uh, uh, presentation and uh, knowledge sharing. So now I would like to call upon Mr. Sudha, Sudha Randan, uh, a friend of mine who has been uh, an engineer, a manager, and now he has his own uh, tra training company called Bean Valley. So, uh, and he's going to talk about AI changing the tourism industry. So Mr. Sudha, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sri. And uh, also, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, given uh, for, to participate in the uh, event. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see uh, my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. So let me... 
Okay, so now it is a very interesting topic that we're going to discuss about today. It's basically um, how AI is changing uh, tourism industry. So basically, uh, this is uh, after the uh, IR4 revolution, explosion, explosion of revolution, IR4 4.0. Okay, I'm sure you all know what is industrial revolution 1, 2, 3, and so forth. So now we are in the fourth era. So, um, so AI is uh, actually uh, it's a game changer and definitely uh, changing a lot of uh, uh, landscape, is disrupting a lot of industry and so forth. So let's talk about IR 4.0. Before we go deeper, how AI actually actually uh, changing a uh, uh, tourism industry. Now, so IR 4.0 is consists of a uh, big data. Uh, so uh, then IoT, IoT stands for Internet of Things, and of course AI, uh, cloud computing, uh, blockchain, and uh, cybersecurity. So basically, uh, you know, people are now afraid that you know uh, there'll be a lot of uh, job losses will be there because of the uh, technology and uh, automation that which the, the uh, technology brought to us. But in reality, what's happening is not that it's actually opening a lot of avenues for new jobs uh, to be created uh, based on the automation or based on machine learning. So AI is very much on the uh, machine learning. So basically what we try to achieve is basically AI is uh, trying to uh, uh, copy or trying to do as human, you know, in terms of uh, tasking, in terms of uh, uh, data analysis, in terms of decision making and uh, problem solving. So later we will we'll look into, into that, how actually uh, tourism, uh, AI actually uh, disrupting a tourism. Now, so just a, a little bit on the AI, what, so what it means of AI? So AI definitely everyone knows that stands for artificial intelligence. So basically the aim of the uh, AI is basically, uh, we wanna, you know, uh, to accomplish what a human can do in terms of reasoning. So now before our industrial revolution 4.0, what happens was basically uh, humans are still controlling the automation processes. You know, our robots are not that smart. Okay. Uh, and then after that, what happens uh, after the industrial revolution three, when we go into a four, so there's an explosion into uh, how you want to make it uh, AI part of uh, our life. So basically that's at the board. I mean, that's how it all the, you know, started. So now the industry, as most of the a lot of I would say most of the industry have been disrupted with the IR4, especially AI. Now you can see, uh, you know, um, a lot of uh, tasks, a lot of jobs are at the background is basically AI. You know, it's like a, you, uh, for example, even in in Japan, I I think I believe saw saw it in the YouTube. You know, there's uh, uh, you know there's no no human at all at, at, at the hotel and actually fully operated by a you know, robot. So, so that's that's the that's the advancement or that's the future that we, that we are talking about in, in especially in tourism. So uh, AI also uh, will uh, assist. Okay, it, it's also assisting at the moment in the decision making, uh, interpreting speech. Okay, let's say you want to interpret speech to a text, uh, vice versa, uh, performing complex tasks. Of course, now also in especially in, uh, in the automobile industries, AI is is doing a lot of uh, things. Uh, space aerospace. Even in the medical, some surgeries are performed are performed by robots, and also uh, customer customer experience and also uh, customer journey, especially tourism industries. So I'm sure that you all know that a lot of people now, whenever especially in social media, you know they're already uh, using uh, what you call it the chatbots, you know, to increase uh, customer experience. You know, They'll, so those days we only have office hours. After office hours, you won't have uh, a receptionist. You won't have anyone attending to a customer query. So what happens now is the, the, you know, we have like a robot assistance like 24 times time through a chatbot, you know, so they, 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 they can, they can assist if any time. So if now people even want to have any queries at two o'clock, three o'clock, so you know, just want to go there, you know, they just go to your website or you to your social media site. So just, you can type questions. There'll be as an answer. So that, that increase the customer experience, uh, are also, uh, helping uh, the customer journey. And also, uh, as I said before, it is actually uh, disrupting many industries, not only tourism, education, automobile, food delivery, even today is like, uh, you know, everything's future, in future probably you're gonna, gonna have a self-driving car. So we don't need the drivers. So that's that sort of a disruption we are talking and, and it's already there. And many jobs out of this IR4 is already uh, coming out. So data scientists, Intel already started employing a data scientist, uh, cybersecurity, uh, machine learning uh, programmers, engineers, and so forth. So <clears throat> all because of 
IR 4.0 and also uh, technology technology explosion. So in previous slides, we're gonna next slides we're gonna look at how actually uh, specifically AI is actually changing uh, tourism industry. Okay, so what is the AI role in the tourism industry? Basically, uh, as you know that as a human side, we only can do a very limited task now. So because of, because of strength and our capacity and all that. But so whenever we want to go uh, ex, uh, customer superior customer experience, we want to deliver wow experience to customers. Of course, we have to have the automation, uh, uh, what do you call it, element in, in, in our operations, you know, even in uh, the way that we operate our, our business. So, so one of the benefit how actually uh, AI is uh, shaping up tourism is that basically they, they can perform multiple tasks at the same time. Okay, so you don't need employ or hoteliers do not have to, have to employ a lot of people, a lot of staff, concierge people, you know, to, to just take care of the, the uh, customer experience. So AI can help you, you know, to do a multiple task. It could be a front end, it could be a back end, you know, so crunching the data, it could be, you know, uh, answering your I mean, answering uh, uh, customers' queries through uh, web or social media and so forth. And then, of course, I mean, as a, as a technology uh, ambassador, I would say that, you know, so I convey, I mean, I, I talk about mainly about technology, how actually technology helping business, improvising business process and all that, all that. So I think AI, in my perspective, where, I mean, basically whatever I read, read and I talk to the industry players and all that, actually, it's, it's actually AI is saving a lot of resources in terms of time and money. Okay, those days you have to employ a lot of people, a lot of staffs and all that. But now that because of uh, automation, because of, you know, the advancement of technology, now we, we have uh, softwares, you know, uh, programs that we can develop AI, simple AI. Now companies are a lot actually uh, giving this kind of services for companies, especially hotels. So it could save a lot of time and your, you know, operation costs. Okay, it also, uh, AI also uh, eliminate human error. Of course, uh, as a human, we cannot run away from making errors, right? So, but with the, whenever we deploy AI, right? So whenever we deploy AI, so we can ensure that, you know, errors are being minimized or we can, can say that zero error unless the system, system itself crashed. But that is very unlikely to happen. So it also, AI also helps in terms of problem solving. Okay, problem solving whenever, uh, we are minimizing problem whenever we deploying AI, okay? In, in, the, in the tourism, I mean, your customer experience and your CRM, whatever. So we are, uh, reducing the problem together. So that's why uh, those days we have, uh, sometimes we need, we need to take one day, two days, we want to uh, get the manager's consent and all that. So we need to manage this feedback, uh, you know, uh, and then we need to get a people's opinion on it. But nowadays, no more. So robots are being programmed, AI is being programmed where, you know, they can uh, being programmed. So let's say if a customer, or if they have such a scenario, so how they react and so forth. So that's being programmed in AI. So that saves a lot of time and also ensure your customer experience not being disrupted. And also another important part of AI is basically uh, data analysis. And now we, we say about data analysis, we're talking about crunching data. So we know that we have a, a lot of abundance of data nowadays. So that's why the big data comes in. So, so what are we gonna do with a lot of data? So basically what we do is so we do our data, uh, AI systems will do our data crunching so where they can give you some predictions. So basically a real-time prediction. So, okay, how customers are behaving. So what sort of uh, pricing that customer are preferring, you know, even your, your customer experience after, how, after their stay in your hotels, how they find it, uh, the experience. So you can get the real-time data. So without the, using the real-time data, so you're gonna do, uh, do, do, do come up with some strategies. Okay, let's say you find out that this is a potential of, of uh, potential of uh, uh, what you call it, of trend that's happening so it gives you uh, uh, immediate uh, solution. I'll say the immediate solutions, immediate insights, so that you can tap the insights. You, you you can use that insight, you know, to to craft your own strategy, you know, to deploy and all that. So uh, so for me, is AI is a game changer on delivering uh, excellent customer service for most hotels and resorts, lah. Okay. Now, so I'm I'm gonna walk through some example in AI. So basically, uh, we talk about chatbots. So what are the things that from AI that we can use or we can deploy uh, in the uh, hotel or tourism industry. We can use chatbots, uh, online customer service. So AI will respond 24 times seven, okay? So we don't need deploy, you know, uh, uh, have a nice shift or people, you know, just, just responding. Then if let's say customer want to request immediately so they can chat with the chat box. And uh, robots also uh, nowadays, 
some hotels in US, they already starting to deploy robots, which they can interface customer face to face. So, so what happened is whenever they face uh, the, the the robot interact with customers, right? So it cut queues at receptions and receptions, and uh, overall that's it's all also improve overall efficiencies. Okay, your front desk become clearer, so your customer have a better experience in terms of uh, the, the, you know whenever people are attending uh, their their queries and then so forth. So, for example, uh, Hilton Hotel uh, deployed robot called Connie. I'm sure you all have seen that. It's called a robot concierge where you know you will answer all your queries where you want to go, um, you know, what time is your check-in time, so what time is your check-out time, so on and so forth. So you can check the uh, YouTube. So you just, just uh, type robot concierge, uh, or you call it a Connie uh, in the hotel, uh, Hilton Hotel. Uh, another uh, critical element in the uh, deploying AI in tourism is basically for the uh, data processing and data analysis. That is very important. So nowadays, uh, today, we have to hire consultants, you know, uh, we have to pay a large sum in order to, you know, to get some insights based on their expertise. That, that, that will take a lot, uh, much longer time. Like basically, we're talking about three to six months. But, but by deploying this AI, having a system, AI system in, the, uh, uh, in, in, our, in our, our operation, all that, so we can have a real-time data. Okay, when I would say real-time data, basically, uh, we don't have to wait uh, for one month or two months. Immediately, one week, or possibly some, uh, some system can, can give you, give you a real-time. Okay, but crunchy, and then it depends on the volume of the data as well. So that's why, as, as I said in the previous slides, it helps you, um, you know, to, to come up with your own strategy to understand your customers' pulse, so what they like, what they don't like, so that's what I say, so that you can strategize, you can mobilize your people, and also give you insights on whether you want to invest on something or not. So that's that's very useful. See, in future, data is the king. So make sure that you know. That's why whenever you use AI, so you have to uh, fully utilize. The data which you already have, okay. Uh, okay, so this is something that um, I think uh, this is my last slide probably. So what do we do basically? Uh, just uh, uh, we do advisory for companies on technology adoption, IT training, so forth. Uh, this is my company's website, email, and phone. Okay, so anything that uh, you wanna uh, ask, that probably you can shoot me an email. Okay, that's that's conclude uh, my presentation on the AI on for for tourism industry. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Suda, for your insight on AI in the tourism industry. Uh, very, interested, uh, very interesting to know that Connie is around and uh, something new. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but I haven't seen any, any uh, I mean, uh, AI-based uh, initiative in Malaysia so far, but Last year, Eco Majesty is going to start on one hotel in JB, in JB, but I'm not sure whether Smart Hotel is already there or not. I see. I see. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Mr. Sudha. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'd like to call upon Mr. Fazal. Mr. Fazal, the founder of uh, Crescent Rating, based in Singapore. Uh, a very uh, knowledgeable man who has made a, a very great impact on certifying hotels, uh, Muslim-friendly hotels, and he also has a Halal Trip. He's also the owner of Halal Trip. So, Mr. Fazal, I, I hand over the, the floor to you. Thank you, Dr. Sri. Thank you. Um, I assume you can see my screen and also my audio. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening to everyone. First of all, I want to thank iPortal, Dr. Rushdi and DHS Hospitality Academy for Dr. Sri for inviting me to speak today. I think if you look at the you know, Muslim market, you know, we have seen in the last uh, 10 years, uh, you know, it has grown from a niche market to a mainstream market. Uh, and one of the key enablers of this growth, especially in the last few years, has been technology. You know? um, and in the post-COVID era that we're all talking about, I mean, as we all have said, you know, technology will definitely play a key, more crucial role, uh, especially in the Muslim market, if you want to take this particular Muslim market to the next level. So, I mean, we saw a lot of speakers, uh, you know, talk a lot about use cases of technologies. Um, uh, it was really uh, good to hear all these use cases. I'm going to share with you um, how some of these relate to, in particular, the Muslim traveler's journey. Um, in, 
Uh, let me just to put some uh, context to it in the in the Global Muslim Travel Index 2019 report. Um, uh, it's a Global Muslim Travel Index. It's a report that we release every year uh, where we rank countries on how Muslim friendly they are and also um, update the trends and and, um, and 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 what to watch in the Muslim market. So we identified. So basically. Uh, we identified 2019 as the beginning of the next phase of halal travel market development when we termed it as halal travel 2.0. Um, and then we identified four key drivers which will shape this next phase of the development. And they were technology, social activism, demographics, and the environment. They're of course not mutually exclusive, they overlap. Um, the disruption brought about by COVID pandemic will definitely accelerate uh, the impact of these drivers. And, and of course, as we've you know, we all been talking about technology today, technology is, uh, will play an even more pivotal role in the traveler's journey. Um, I mean, simply, for example, we need to you know, uh, uh, reimagine health and safety by redesigning the, the traveler's experience at all touch points using technology. Um, Fazal, yeah. Um, we can actually. Can you remove your notes? It's right in the middle of the screen. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Um. Yeah. So. Um. In in fact, in uh, in the. Uh, sorry, I got a bit. Uh, hold on. Let me get my thoughts around. Since I moved my notes. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the difference between Halal Travel 1.0 and 2.0, I think this also we actually uh, talked about in our report in 2019. Um, and that was um, that uh, we will go from, uh, there are many differences in, 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 uh, in, in, in how, uh, how uh, the, the user interacts in um, used to interact before and how they will interact uh, uh, in the in the new scenario. I mean, we'll move from a, a, a transactional kind of a relationship uh, to managing relationships, you know, uh, real relationships, and that that will require that um, we uh, uh, leverage massively uh, technology and, and data. I mean, we talked a lot about data in the earlier presentation as well. Um, and what we did also, what we have been doing the last few years also is um, look at all the touch points of uh, the traveler's journey, um, especially when it comes to Muslim uh, travelers and what, um, what each of these touch points require in terms of the different needs. And I think in the new normal, we need to reimagine how we can use technology in, in all these touch points. And we, we actually listened to some of them in, uh, in, the, in the earlier presentations as well, in terms of you know, uh, how you promote your destination using VR and AR and, and AI-like uh, technologies. Um, what we have been also doing since uh, 2016 um, is that we have been releasing reports uh, under the theme of what we call Halal Travel Frontiers. Uh, we, we released the first report uh, in 2018. The second edition was in 2019 and the third edition in, uh, in 2020. In these reports, actually, we identified many trends that are you know, driven by technologies. You know, of course, we talked a lot about that in terms of AR, VR, AI. I mean, all of our discussions are basically surrounding those three main technologies and of course supported by data. Uh, and, you know, of course, you know, smartphones is probably the key touch point when it comes to enabling these, uh, these technologies. Um, what, so I'm just going to sort of go through some of those uh, uh, key technology trends that we uh, looked at in these reports. Of course, these reports looked at beyond technology, behavioral changes as well that we want to look at. Uh, in, the, in the Halal Travel Frontier 2018 report, we actually identified you know, some 10 um, uh, trends to watch. It's slightly you know, older, so I'm not going to talk about it. So uh, all these reports are available on our, on our, on our, on our website. 
And in 2019, we actually identified 17 um, trends uh, that uh, we should watch. Uh, this was, of course, pre-COVID. But I think some of those trends are really relevant now. And I'm going to just briefly touch upon about three of those trends that we identified in this report. Um, so I, as you see, you know, there were 17 trends that we identified from, from technology uh, related uh, um, trends to other behavioral uh, trends that we identified. Um, I think we talked a lot about this, uh, you know, AI um, in the context of travel and tourism and, and especially, which, you know, earlier, earlier speaker talked about how uh, you know, providing uh, service excellence. Uh, AI will help in providing service excellence. And I think it's really relevant. Um, I think AI will and should empower Muslim travelers. Um, I think it, it really will help build uh, specially recommendations engines that can better understand, you know, Muslim traveler preferences. Um, of course, the challenge, of course, in, in, in all this, AI, which is basically driven by data, is uh, you know how transparent uh, and how unbiased the machine learning algorithms are, and not which are which are related to data. I mean, how can you avoid biased data and take into account the? And when it comes to the Muslim market, how you can take you know account take into account the unique behavior of uh, of, of of Muslims. Um, so th I think that's that's key uh, to engaging and retaining them. Uh, in the AI enable uh, travels uh, service space, which I think the earlier speaker spoke of. I think when it comes to the Muslim market, I think it is about how do we create unbiased, I mean, we already have seen that issue of biased data impacting, uh, uh, you know, AI uh, controlled uh, services. So I think that's the challenge, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? Um, I think there's no other probably solution other than, you know, get uh, the experts together, uh, tourism players, halal travel sector players together and, and work, you know, you know, some agile way to sort of make sure that, you know, we uh, have, you know, recommendations engines and other predictive analysis, which take into account real, uh, you know, uh, behavior patterns of Muslims and the wants of Muslims. The second uh, one I wanted to share on that particular report is, you know, halal assurance is still a challenge. I mean, um, uh, authenticating halal claims is still a key challenge to overcome. I think here also um, you probably can use technologies like AR uh, specifically to help uh, users probably to even self-authenticate and verify halal assurance, um, probably using multiple tools, uh, you know, mobile apps. Um, of course, one technology is AR, uh, maybe, you know, through AR, uh, digital information of of your the halal status of the restaurants would be layered probably into 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 users environment so i think that's an, uh, another area which i think especially now we are going contactless will will probably become much more important and i think there's uh, room to look at that area as well continuing on the ar also um i think we also talked about uh, earlier uh, on this one um you know how do we uh, use ar to provide a lot more immersive experience uh, for Muslim travelers. I think the issue here is that, you know, some, especially when it comes to some heritage sites, uh, especially in, uh, in some places, sometimes the, 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 the real uh, Muslim heritage is sort of lost in history. So I think uh, AR probably could help in, in, uh, uh, in bridging that gap between, you know, what's probably, you know, the main narrative versus, you know, historical narrative of those historical sites. So that's a little bit about uh, what we sort of uh, envisaged in our 2019 report. In 2020 report, we looked at, uh, I think, 16 uh, trends to watch. Um, yeah, so, um, and of course, these are a lot more uh, generic, not specific to the, the Muslim market, I think. Uh, the e-wallets, they are becoming a lot more important now, especially in the, in the, in the post-COVID contactless world that we are going into. Facial, facial recognition is becoming uh, possible now, you know, QR codes, uh, thumbprint technology. So I think all this means that uh, e-commerce payment transactions are going to become the norm. Uh, and there is an opportunity, I think, even within the Muslim space 
uh, for especially for fintech companies to look at how they can value add uh, use you know with using those kind of e-wallets and, and apps how can you value add to muslim travelers you know digital transactions so i think that's something that probably you could look at um, i think this is something uh, we looked at earlier as well you know in the 2019 report we identified uh, the um, the umrah which is the pilgrimage to mecca uh, will become diy do it yourself you know we predicted this you know a couple of years ago and now actually it's a reality we already have Umrah services inventory is completely online now. So I think uh, this is what we identified in earlier last year that now the battle will be for the, the data uh, because I think Umrah and Hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage has never been really analyzed from a consumer behavior, really seriously you know, analyzed from a consumer behavior point of view. Now that all of the, the transactions, all of the, the, the touch points have gone digital, I think that gives you a huge opportunity to, 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 to really find out the behavior of, uh, of, of Muslim pilgrimages, uh, which is like six, seven million people a year. So I think that's a huge potential to, and, and I'm sure that's going to come uh, in the next uh, year or so. Um, I think uh, just to close up, I think the halal lifestyle events also something that we um, we identified as will will undergo massive changes. That this was before COVID, uh, and I think the COVID will accelerate this. I mean, halal lifestyle events has been these are you know conferences and exhibitions have been have been behind technology for a long time, uh, and they were. I think we saw that they needed a, a change. I think that will happen now. Uh, I mean, for 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 example, I participated the, the, uh, for the first time in hybrid hybrid halal lifestyle event yesterday where I had to speak and I was amazed by the, the, the smoothness of being able to run a hybrid event. Uh, you know, I was, I was on Zoom and there were speakers on the floor and it went extremely smoothly. Um, finally, I think um, uh, future ready for Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Um, Gen Z Muslims are now entering the workplace uh, and of course they will play a key role in determining the, you know, the next phase of travel. In addition, you see Gen Alpha will also play an important role. I mean, they are making decisions. They used to make decisions of travel before we stop traveling. I mean, they are a lot more mature when we are get to travel now. I mean, they will, they will uh, you know, probably uh, 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 be much more influential. I mean, these people first learn to use their fingers, you know, to point, uh, to uh, objects or, or swipe smartphones, uh, technology is really you know in, in, in their DNA. So, travel sector uh, really needs to be future ready for them. Um, one last thing, I think I think we talked a lot about data. So I think in the Muslim space, we realize that data is is as some people keep saying, it's the, the oil of uh, of this uh, generation. So I think data was key, and we we identified that. Uh, couple of years ago. So we have been building a database, a data platform, uh, putting all those Muslim behavioral data, Muslim demographics data, uh, and eventually, uh, you know, able to do predictive analysis, and also real time analysis as well. So that's the, so we're trying to link um, what's, uh, what, you know, what technology should do, and also back it up with data. Uh, back it up to the, you know, provide data to the industry so that they can use data to make those decisions on what type of technology that they could, um, they could deploy and, and make the journey of a Muslim traveler uh, better. Yeah, so I think that's uh, basically it for me. And thank you very much, Dr. Sri. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fazal, uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, something new for the Muslim market, uh, especially on Gen Z and Gen Alpha and, and the things, the reports that you all have uh, brought forward. I think this is something that uh, will be very beneficial uh, to countries, especially Malaysia, to, to see and to see how we can enhance uh, our tourism, especially uh, on the Muslim market. So thanks a lot, Mr. Fazal. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call upon a very good friend of mine, Dr. Razif, uh, who, who has been very supportive 
He is the president of the uh, Tourism Education Association Malaysia. Uh, he is also from uh, University Technology Mara, and uh, he is also the uh, consultant to the Institute of Business Excellence in UITM. So I hand over uh, the floor to Dr. Razif. Over to you, Dr. Razif. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sri. Uh, Hope you are doing well there and also to the fellow panelists. And I enjoyed the presentation today because uh, things to learn. Uh, I'm not really coming from this uh, technology, but uh, I try to give my take on the way that we, before we really you know, instill technology in tourism, then we have to think of what will be the you know, variables that we have to include for our uh, future analysis or the equation that we want to use for this, you know, technology, tech tourism. Okay, uh, allow me to share. Okay, I hope my screen is visible to all of you. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, before I start, I always, uh, I always use this, you know, these three terms in this current environment because like right now, Looking at this domestication, where we have imagine or we have to perceive that uh, people have to be at home, so we have to make them love home more than they going out. So it's not like work, you know, as if that everybody here is you know staying at home because we only can travel domestically, right? And then for regionalization, because of the world is left. This one I, I already explained last week during our previous webinar. And one more thing that we still we also need to put into equation is this market. So we have to look market within which this low hanging fruit. But as far as uh, we like to you know uh, discuss about this technology, we sometimes we don't really know the you know, market. We don't really know the domestic market or simply say the captive market. So this is important before we go. We, we go all out with this technology. We still, we need to understand what do we have, you know, in our hand, what do we have in uh, the market that can easily reachable. Okay, so that's why I would say that these three uh, terms or these three uh, strategies will be vital for this immediate future. And I always say uh, during my presentation or when I involve in any discussions that we have to look into immediate future and we have to analyze the progress of the policy or the progress of the strategies or tactics that we you know we uh, use okay uh, again the most important thing now is to look into the main strategic question it's the matter of question are you going to remain as status quo or you want to start with this new business process because remember in several uh, discussions that I have with the policy makers and they see that we cannot you know uh, propose new ideas because they are some stone or call it something that will, will block or proceed you know with this uh, the, the strategy that's why I would say uh, the world now is, is unpredictable and what we want to do today is to instill confidence but at the end of the day we don't have a scenario so we don't have there's no big scenario but what we, we do have is the data uh, during this COVID-19 as well as the data uh, pre-COVID level data so we want to proceed so if you want to use the current data so we don't want to have that, that kind of outlook as well as the outcome uh, we, using uh, the basis, you know, using the uh, pandemic as the basis for the future prediction. So that's why we have to, you know, we need to find one basis, one that, that can help us, you know, that can instill confidence to the tourism players. But what we have now, when we give the pessimistic figures, then the industry players, you know, that, that will demoralize or demotivate them. So we don't want that to happen. We want to instill this you know, confidence. Okay. So, there are several uh, themes that we can start thinking for this technology or tech tourism because at the end of the day, 
what you want is to have to to make your business visible is one thing and the other thing is to make your technology visible it must be noticed by the stakeholders because it, it's no point right if you have the technology you invest in the recent technology or maybe you are the first mover uh, in the industry but that be noticed by the stakeholders because they don't really go uh, you know go out and travel so we want to make this you know if let's see everybody in the industry use this or everybody in the industry agree uh, with the recent technology or with the latest technology then it, it, it might help you know uh, the stakeholders to, to to notice okay and then the adaptability this is another thing that i always mention in my previous webinar where we have to make sure that it must be adaptable or it must be you know ready to use by the existing workforce as well as the customer and user and then the flexibility so the flow of the technology with the current network so that is important because like the previous speakers talked about iot uh you know 5g and then a big data so we want to make everything connected or integrate so that is uh, the request that we have to answer and the usability so this sometimes we want to you know we want to bring uh, new technologies so we want to we, we feel that this is the innovation that needed by the market or by the customer but at the end of the day we have to ask ourselves whether the technology is usable to the to the user or the, the technology is usable to the you know to the staff to the back of the house okay so that's why it is important to weigh whether it is it will benefit to streamline the work process or it will be beneficial to the end user and uh, this is something that when i think during this COVID 19 especially this year people start you know uh, make this one of the uh, you know talk uh, sustainability where we, we have to think about this that uh, you want to still uh, pursuing the mass tourism or studying nowadays people started to use the word slow tourism so can we say that that will be the change of behavior post pandemic or that slow tourism maybe can be applicable during this pandemic or this post pandemic before uh, we move to the next stage years of international rebound in 2024 so that would be the question again that I would say important to the uh, you know technology people or the uh, technology companies. And um, if, if let's say we use your know, several uh, theories, at the end of the day, remain applicable is uh, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. So this one remain popular. And in fact, during this COVID nineteen, also people revisit these uh, theories, and we can see that. Uh, if we want to proceed with a new segment, or can the destination answer this question? How can it? How can we determine uh, which segment is the most viable and number? Again, people talk about millennials, and I have one, you know, research with my friends that uh, study on the senior travelers because they feel that uh, the senior travelers have, you know, they have the income stability and they have the time and they. The, you know, they, they can travel in leisure and they spend more money during traveling. So do we want to, you know, remain with that idea so we want to change linear traveler, uh, travelers? Okay, so that's why we need to have this market intelligence. Like like right now, what we do have in mind uh, is, are we really using, for example, this internal data pre-COVID? Uh, something that we have in mind or we can get it, uh, you know, in <clears throat> website. And the data uh, that published by the world governing bodies and action by the competitors because this is important because you usually refer to the competitors and then findings uh, in the research with COVID nineteen or we look at the you know outlook in other disciplines of studies and this one is one of the you know I would say the theme that uh, quite emerging recently the end user behavioral change because we want to see how they react. Uh, in these posts, like, uh, especially in TikTok, in Facebook, uh, IG, and other social networks. Okay, and so again, in the new thing for 
those who want to proceed with this technology, you have to look into these three. Uh, I would say this is my personal opinion, where we would like to you know to suggest on the new travel needs, and <clears throat> can we say that uh, the demographic characteristics and changes? Do you know that? Can you uh, explain on that? And finally, I think all of you here are quite you know advanced where you have presented on the changes in technological or mobile devices behavior. So I would say that maybe we can say this would, be, would never end. But at the end of the day, sometimes the changes will, you know, will, uh, it will uh, reflect or affect the industry temporarily. But we want to see, uh, because nowadays everything is not, you know, fixed or permanent. That, uh, that's why I say, how can we make sure that the technology that uh, we introduced during this COVID-19 will be applicable or will remain in the market forever. Okay. And then, okay, that's why I, this actually is not really smart as, you know, so to speak, but the smart marketing here refers to uh, the old uh, uh, marketing theories, uh, which are S uh, stands for specific. So when we want to have uh, you know, new technology, so before this, we, we always hear the word is uh, the acronym SMART, but we, we have to revisit. For example, how we, uh, if let's say you, you the new ideas or new strategies, as a survey, the objective must uh, detail out the input or output. Do you have the targeted or forecasted? Do you do the analysis of the forecasted against the actual figure? And can you uh, we can we can we quantify uh, the monthly? So this is you know important. If not, uh, we don't really have the target. Okay, and then measurable. Again, uh, we need to quantify the outcome. So we must have uh, solid indicators whether the outcome is good or bad. And for that to be done, so we need the threshold. You know, this uh, new performance indicator. So we cannot use the data pre COVID level. So now we must have the new barometer of uh, from 2022, 23 up until 2026, or maybe we need to extend up until 2030. So it depends on the industry. And is there any rubrics or checklist or scorecard that we use, you know, that we can share? And attainable. So it must be achievable in short run and potential to be extended long run because we have to look into management constraints, especially for the hotel players or for the hospitality and tourism players, where we can see that most of them are short of staff and they have constraints, especially when uh, many people ha had to be retrenched or laid off through this COVID-19. And can, can we see that they are still uh, competitive? Okay? And is there any benchmark that can serve as a comparison? And then for relevant, so the objective must consider the current state of the business and also you know, we have to put into account the environmental, technological and societal change. And in fact, these are you know one of the themes for research. People would like to point new terms, people would like to post new findings, and we can see do we agree with the current theme theme of for instance slow tourism? And I'm sure uh Philip Cocktail already introduced the uh, anti-consumerism. I think we before COVID-19, but now it started to re-emerge the word uh, slow to them. I think we have to ask ourselves whether we can, you know, you can uh, generate revenues with this slow tourism. And are we uh, gearing to that changes? And for time this, um, we like to, uh, you know, to have the time frame, the duration for assessment. So you need to have regular assessment using the scorecard. And uh, the most important thing, what will be the consequence to the target is not achieved? Because for using this tech tourism or technology, when you want to introduce or you want to invest uh, the new technology, so it will, you know, you need to uh, pump or, or, or sorry, you need to, you know, uh, uh, you know, you have investment, huge investment needed to buy the new technology. So that's why I would say, if, like, what if, you know, if uh, no, uh, no result out of the investment. So again, this is important. Okay, and uh, for this, you need to we we have here to align the individual department and organi organizational goal, avoid comp conflict at all levels. So this is for the best practice, and then for the progress report, we we have to uh, 
do this regular track progress that will uh, justify uh, on the performance of the business. And in, for that, uh, for the marketing, so it's important to have the informational uh, appeals, well-created uh, features, attributes, and benefits that can easily grasp uh, from a customer point of view and the transformational appeals. So again, I would say these two things are critical. And before I end my presentation, uh, we can see this, you know, in 2020, 2020 and 2021, there, are, there were sharp decline and drop in all segments uh, and analysis. But there, there's only one, there was only one thing increase, which is the technology usage and adaptation by almost all segments. It's not only the millennials, but also to the uh, baby boomers and all walks of life. And before this, this Problems, uh, uh, all idioms, necessity is the mother of invention. Maybe necessity is the force to the change behavior that what we have seen in this COVID 19. And uh, that's why I say uh, finally, uh, we have to focus in this tech savvy segment. So sometimes we want to, we, we all of us agree that millennials are the tech savvy segment, but we need to properly, uh, you know, uh, look into the end user. So who are the end users? you know, that have this tech savvy, expressive engagement in the social media by exploring the one attention, demand for content and inputs. So this is one of the most important things to provide content, especially to the destination, as well as to the uh, service providers. Because, uh, you know, when we want to restart tourism, so we, we must uh, get ready. So sometimes the content must be there. We need to promote first before uh, the tourism will be restarted in the future. And uh, this end user is lifelong learning. So that will conclude my presentation. Thank you and over to you, uh, Dr. Sri. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Razif. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, something, I mean, like I always say, I learn new things and I hope that I attend more of your lectures so I can uh, qualify for a master's. Very interesting speech. Uh, now I'd like to call upon uh, our next speaker. Uh, this is uh, Inche Mohammad Nazri Jaffa. Uh, he's the founding CEO and group chairman of uh, uh, Spatial Works Sundaran uh, A graduate from University of Tennis, did his masters, and also worked in uh, University of Malaya in the Department of Geography. He has extensive uh, experience in GIS and he has done a lot of uh, uh, work. So let's hear from uh, Inche Mohammad Nazri. Uh, over to you. Hello, Assalamualaikum warahmatullah, and a very good uh, evening for friends uh, coming from Asia. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes, 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 Mr. Nazir. All right, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, good day from those from the other side of the world, from US, from uh, uh, st still seeing daylight. OK, you see my screen? Can you yes. see my screen? Yes, yes. OK, all right. Uh, OK, I'm going to play my screen. Give me a minute. OK. I'm going to talk about GIS technology for tourism industry in the post-pandemic era. Uh, why is this important? Because I think uh, tourism is one of the most heavily impacted industry during uh, COVID era, yeah? during uh, uh, pandemic era. So uh, my name is Nazari Jaffa, and uh, I'm presenting this uh, uh, material uh, written by me and Professor Dr. Rosan Rainis, who, who was also a former GIS uh, lecturer and currently serving as a consultant uh, with Spatial Works, my company in Putrajaya. Okay, this is going to be simple, straightforward presentation uh, because I'm not in hospitality business, but I'm more in GIS. I'm I'm going to introduce what is GIS, how GIS can help foster tourism during, uh, during post-pandemic era. And uh, I mentioned a little bit about augmented reality uh, uh, with GIS. I think Dr. Zhang, uh, Dr. Yi Zhang, and also uh, a few speakers before, before us have already mentioned about AR. 
uh, especially and also uh, I think uh, Mr. Faisal Bahardan, yeah, from Singapore, talking about uh, AR halal hub and so on. Without further ado, uh, may I continue? Okay, GIS actually is a system that creates, manage, analyze, and maps all types of data. Simply put, it's a mapping tool. What I'm going to talk today is developing a smart tool, not smart marketing, but smart tool <laughs> uh, on how to uh, promote uh, GIS, uh, to, to promote tourism during this uh, uh, post-pandemic era. GIS contains database or content to show what is where and how things are spatially related, spatially related to one another. GIS connects data to map, integrating location data where things are with all types of descriptive information, what things are like there. Okay. So um, I think one good example, uh, and many of us have used it, is Google Map. Although I would not call it a true GIS uh, uh, platform, but, but it is a web mapping platform which consumer application uh, 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 can use for uh, finding locations, getting directions, doing uh, interactive panoramic views, real-time traffic condition, route planning, and so on. I think almost everybody has seen this. Yeah, so uh, I'm not here to uh, to discuss uh, GIS in detail, but just to share how GIS can help. Okay, now with the internet technology and 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 uh, fast data uh, uh, transfer, uh, collaboration, uh, multi-party collaboration is now uh, uh, become uh, possible. Yeah. So also that we can make better decisions, greater efficiency, uh, more cost effective, uh, more effective definition, uh, effective uh, communication. Okay, uh, uh, hold on a minute. I something uh, I have a problem here. I'm going to move my things here. And I want to because it's blocking my own view. Okay, tourism, as I mentioned, I'm not uh, in hospitality business. So I need to look at definition, what is meant by tourism. When we talk about tourism, it involves people traveling to and staying in places outside of their usual environment. For not more than one consecutive year for leisure and not less than 24 hour business or other purpose. This is as defined by UNWTO. I think you guys are, are much more uh, uh, aware of this. Tourism is the act and process of spending time away from home and so on, okay? And while making use of commercial provision of services at the uh, intended destination. Wait. My screen freeze, okay. So there are many types of uh, tourism. Again, I'm not going to dwell much on these uh, different types of tourism. As, as you can see just now, uh, we have talked about uh, halal tourism, pilgrimage tourism, domestic tourism, international education, health, and so on. So there are many forms of tourism. Please computer, work with me. Okay, if we can summarize, tourism always involves going away from home. The way I see it, if you stay at home, looking at a virtual reality of places, that's not quite tourism. Because uh, uh, tourism is part of basic economics in which uh, uh, economic based on uh, economic based theory, um, you have to uh, tourism is one way to bring money from outside, let's say from outside of Malaysia coming to Malaysia, for example, and spend in Malaysia. That is tourism. Or uh, you spend away from home. Uh, it involves going to places less familiar to you. Normally, it's short term with many purposes. 
there's even UFO tourism in US. I, uh, all this involves location and locational attributes. So, now we look at post-pandemic tourism with new normal. As put, uh, put forward by uh, uh, World Travel and Tourism Council, uh, safe travel is the way to go now. So there, there are protocols uh, uh, applied, there are guidelines applied. For example, uh, USA uh, have guidelines on uh, uh, guidance for travel in new normal. Indonesia, for example, also have uh, guidance. And we're all aware of the three Cs, uh, no, non-crowded places, avoid contact, uh, close contact settings, avoid confined and closed spaces. All these are uh, ways to reduce or to minimize our risk against COVID-19. Okay. So if, you, if we look at those tourism uh, point of interest are usually popular spot, crowded, difficult, most likely difficult to comply with WHO 3C's uh, SOP. Uh, if we go uh, beyond uh, before 2019, we have uh, an area, say for example, with bus loads of people, there's no really crowd control. But now full capacity is not defined as similar as uh, uh, 2019. COVID definitely is going to be a feature of our life now in the future, maybe. Hopefully not, but uh, most likely it will be with us. It's going to be in Malaysia, we, uh, we are taking it as endemic already. Therefore, tourism will involve no large crowd. Social distancing is a must. Therefore, we need new tools to manage and to reboot our tourism industry. So I'm here to talk about GIS and how GIS can be that new tool to help reboot our tourism industry. Okay, how GIS technology can help foster tourism during post-pandemic? We can look at this from two angles, tourism service provider side. Uh, that is, uh, we one uh, su uh, suggestion that I would like to put forward here is that uh, we have to develop a GIS-based system that in, uh, as an integrated tourist and tourist tourism management system for more efficient, effective, and sustainably managed tourism activities, which may include functionalities like inventories of all tourism activities and area. If you're coming to Kuala Lumpur, uh, you want to know all interesting sites, or you may already have uh, ideas, let's say, to visit all culturally related uh, sites in Kuala Lumpur. So uh, with this new system, it should enable us to identify what are those activities within Kuala Lumpur, for example. Free tour planning and booking system. Uh, the system should enable users to do pre-tour planning and booking, uh, which which will provide us uh, like traveling plan and scheduling. Uh, I think Dr. Gizek just now have shown uh, a mobile apps application uh, as developed in China, uh, in which it will enable user to customize itinerary services uh, and, and customize uh, uh, customize why uh, the uh, the tourist one okay it should also provide uh covid 19 status crowd control management hello hello can you hear me okay crowd control management uh for example we need real-time crowd size monitoring for example once we open uh, uh our national zoo on the first day there were flocks of people going in uh, it would have been better if uh, there is some form of crowd control management in which it provides real-time number of people coming in so that uh, 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 
potential tourists won't waste time queuing and waiting and taking their turns, okay? Information about the downstream services available within the area. If you go to National Zoo, for example, what, where are the food outlets, what are the popular ones? Interactive multimedia system to support personalized self-guided tour. I'm going to explain this uh, in, a, in a while. From tourists or end user side, their concern is they need safe travel. So uh, they will travel in small group. Uh, it may be individual or small group of uh, num a small number of people that they know, less or minimal interaction of other tourists, ability to preview, plan, and or schedule their intended destination, point of interest, and so on, made aware of safety and security protocols prior to visit. If you're going to a zoo, the protocol may be different than going to a museum or going to a countryside or going to nature hiking and so on. Made aware of real-time crowd size and other issues relevant to them. Ability to search of other downstream services required, such as accommodation, coffee shop, gift shop, and so on. Have fast access to multimedia personnel guide uh, like tour. Okay. Just now, uh, we did mention, uh, I mean, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Zhang and a few others have already mentioned about augmented reality. Augmented reality is a real-time use of information in the forms of text, graphics, audio, and other virtual enhancement integrated with the real world. In other words, you can point and shoot using your handphone. This technology superimposes digital information on whatever you're looking through at your phone camera. If you point and shoot at the location, it will highlight what are the shops, where, what's the name of the road, and so on. Uh, in, in the picture uh, shown here actually is uh, an example where they uh, integrate real world view with the underground uh, utility cable. You don't see the utility cable, but by pointing at that, you integrate the database with the real world view, and then you see uh, where the cable lies and what cable they are. So we can use the same application to tourism. For example, in this case, uh, 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 done by Esri Australia, in which uh, they use it for town excursion. Uh, it can show stops and, and what they are, what they are seeing. Okay. So, for example, it can show uh, where are the coffee shops in this row. Similarly to halal uh, travel just now, they can show uh, what are the halal shops available, what are the menu, any special offer, and so on. In this sense, they don't, the new traveling method, uh, we don't really have to be in large group of people. We can be among family or among close friends who we know, okay? Other potential applications, it can be applied to historical tourism, nature tourism, uh, for example, if you go to islands, for example, uh, before you uh, dive, you point at a location, you can expect, uh, you can see a video file, for example, of what you can uh, expect underneath. What's the current like? What's the, uh, uh, maybe uh, have games related to it, find things that uh, for, for, for a diver. They will make it more interesting. And almost all other types of tourism, as long as involve location, information about the location, and even in real time. So uh, AR and GIS is the tool to go. Challenges in implementing GIS and AR for tourism. We need good data, a good database. Uh, that is the content of the uh, tourism sites and downstream activities within all uh, area uh, within the area of interest. If, say, for example, we're doing an island, say, Tioman Island or Redang Island, we need to capture all the interesting uh, and uh, point of interest uh, that may be uh, attractive to potential tourists. Creative use of technology. Uh, the technology is there. It's already out there. It's just a matter of applying it and developing it. And perhaps one of the um, uh, big, big 
quite a stumbling block is a good internet service. If you're talking about nature, uh, application to nature, for example, if you mount, uh, go mountain hiking or mount, mountain climbing, um, they may not be a good signal up there, but uh, yeah, uh, therefore a good internet service is uh, very much desired. Uh, desire. And, and to end it all, he said, where there's a will, there's a way. If we want to do it, I'm sure we can do it. Uh, the technology is there. Uh, the skill set is there. We've heard about big data. We've heard about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. There are tools. Uh, 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 GIS maps now is widely available all over the world. The technology, AR technology, is uh, matured enough to be uh, to start development, and I'm looking forward uh, Malaysia to uh, kickstart on this soon as possible. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me, and it's a real pleasure. Same here, same here, uh, Inche Muhammad uh, Nazri. Thank you very much for your very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Something different, and uh, we wish in the in the future we will have something like this in Malaysia. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now we like to call this gentleman. I'm not sure whether he's uh, he's from India, basically, but lives in Malaysia. So uh, maybe I will add in a flavor and say that we have Mr. PC from India, uh, who's going to talk about how pandemic fast track uh, digital transformation in business events industry. PC, over to you. Hey, hi, hi. Uh, am I audible? Am I am I audible? Yes, PC, we can hear you. Oh, all right, great. So uh, thank you guys uh, for uh, you know uh, inviting me here. It's a fantastic uh, session. I could see a lot of interesting uh, information, uh, especially about tourism. So I will uh, keep it very short uh, as I know that we are actually running out of time. So um, one thing I will I, I've noticed in today's session is about the tourism accelerator. I think that's the right uh, thing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, that's what we are supposed to. I mean, I think in Malaysia need a tourism accelerator program, especially uh, you know the hospitality industry is uh, so so huge, and you know we have uh, so many sub industries. You know, the aviation, the events, the transport. You know, all those service industries interconnected, and that's a huge scalability uh, opportunities uh, across the board. So I think it's a fantastic initiation. I think somebody need to take it up. I think Malaysia is still. Uh, miss a tourism accelerator or incubator program so i think uh, congratulations to i portal um, for you know coming up with uh, such an amazing uh, opportunity for people out here so uh, yeah so basically i am uh, uh, in the tourism domain in malaysia uh, for almost 15 years plus and uh, i'll talk about a little bit about event industry in specific uh, you know so basically uh, you know everybody knows that you know Events is a very very crucial part of tourism industry business business events industry or we call it mice industry right so uh, Malaysia has been um, having an amazing uh, mice uh, growth all this year still the pandemic um, and it's looking very promising even now so basically uh, you know the entire ecosystem had to you know come to a full stop and uh, uh, we are one of the very few uh, who pivoted and then we had this uh, virtual events and the online events so definitely uh, we could really see uh, what was happening in that space so you know uh, always the the challenges the event industry faced before covid was you know they couldn't actually get uh, get along you know with the kind of crowd they want to pull from the global arena to the local events which was completely uh, impossible when you do physical right so situation you know in the past two years you know everybody is compelled to to basically for forcefully adopt uh, digitalization i think uh, you know something like this what we are doing today i think if we, if we have been physical at this time i don't think anybody could <laughs> be able to pull it off right <laughs> so um so there was apparently you know give uh, birth to many 
amazing technology solutions like even uh, what we built uh, in the past one year in events, uh, online events. So uh, it was actually the space has grew huge and uh, I could see in Asia, look at the event, uh, virtual event industry, if you just specifically talk about virtual event, it's about the size about $200 billion as of today. So it's a huge industry uh, in online events. So, you know, the word hybrid events become a very integral part um, in the event industry and, uh, you know, digital platforms like this become a must-have, right? Uh, I think pre-pandemic, nobody even thought of, you know, uh, having this sort of uh, adoption in, in digital events. So, uh, I think hybrid events uh, is something which definitely uh, the next thing, I mean, it's already been, I mean, we've been doing hybrid events ever since uh, past uh, six months. Uh, it's actually been uh, working out pretty well for the for, for, the, for the organizations because they, in terms of engagement and the result, what they're getting. So I think it's it's always great to, you know, grow new markets and bring in global audience. That's the biggest thing which we can able to do uh, on a very fraction of cost. If you would, you know, if you would have been doing it in physical, it would have been costing a lot more. So I think this is something which uh, is going to stay. And uh, I think tourism is going to get a lot of benefit from uh, these sort of uh, hybrid events uh, or the format which you're going to follow. The industry has already been hybrid now. And tourism, even, you know, the kind of, pro it's, it, it's a fantastic marketing tool. If you look at it from that perspective, uh, you know, we have uh, been done events with uh, more than 20,000 attendees from uh, 56 countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, even physically, I don't think it's uh, any event can, you know, scale up to that kind of strength. And also the engagement is real. Uh, you have the same people coming on board and talk to you face to face. And, you know, the conversation, the deal, uh, whatsoever, uh, it's all same. It's all same as you meet them in physical, just that the physical touch, uh, what you're missing. So I think, uh, yes, for many industry, uh, it is really working well. Um, I think uh, tourism, we should take advantage of this great tool uh, which we have. And I, I'm pretty sure when, uh, uh, you know, when you talk about accelerator, I think, uh, you know, there's a huge, huge opportunity even in the event industry. Yeah, there are a lot of people who build systems and platforms, but they really do not know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they need some guidance. There is some, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, assistance or uh, probably, you know, they need more knowledge about uh, overseas markets and all that. So I think, uh, you know, a program like this is definitely going to add a lot of value uh, in the ecosystem. So, um, you know, I think uh, I, yeah, and we've been successfully running uh, a SaaS platform uh, for hybrid events uh, called virtuallife.my. So if anybody keen to know, uh, explore on, you know, if you if you want to do uh, any virtual ex exhibitions uh, or affairs or whatsoever, you can just, uh, you know, please Google that and you probably get more information or you can contact me. I think over to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Sri. I think I'm, I'm done for now. Any questions, uh, you can ask me. If, if any of you have any questions, uh, please, uh, you know, you can drop it on the chat. I can answer you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sri. Uh, thank you, PC. Thank you very much for your short uh, presentation. And now we come to our last uh, presenter. Uh, basically, uh, it is Mr. Francisco, Mr. Francisco and Miss Sherry uh, on uh, rural tourism and smart uh, tourism concept. Over to you, Mr. Francisco and Miss Sherry. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to uh, enjoy this uh, uh, meeting. It's uh, very interesting. Uh, and we want to share with you our experience about the rural tourism and uh, smart, uh, smart tourism. I try to share uh, the screen. Wait a moment. You see the screen now? Hello? Yes, we see the screen. Yes. Okay. One moment, the next speaker. Okay. So what we want to share with you is our experience. Our company is a company we work, uh, it's a design company, but really we work about the lifestyle design. We have done uh, almost uh, 2,000 uh, uh, projects around the world, uh, 300 uh, project uh, in China, uh, we have finished uh, almost 16 uh, projects. 
our company is a group. We have different uh, experts and experience. Uh, we work with a different team in different city and different country. Our fund, uh, we, we give uh, some uh, service uh, uh, like a, a classical design company, but also we design, we make uh, a position and branding strategy. We work about uh, uh, smart tourism. We work also about uh, uh, operation uh, think uh, about our project. Our fund, uh, Michael Michel, uh, is from LA. He started, uh, he worked with the uh, Olympic Games in 1984. Uh, and uh, you know, Olympic Games in 1984 changed, changed the, the way to make the Olympic Games. They need to make uh, money with the Olympic Games. And then uh, he, he tell uh, us when we work, uh, we need to make uh, the project, uh, uh, make money, not only a, a project without uh, a revenue, and use the, the, what we have. So we want to talk about our, our experience, our project in China, focus about the rural tourism. In the past year, and also in this year, we work about uh, the rural area. You know the policy, maybe you know, uh, 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 the Chinese government want to improve the life and the quality of the life in the rural area. And uh, they enjoy this uh, goal, uh, uh, a lot of company. With this project is a project we make with the Lunan Group. It's one, one uh, uh, big real estate company in China, and they work about uh, uh, a rural area. We make a product, uh, a project uh, over um, to to make a different uh, different project in different area. The key point is to bring the best uh, life in the rural area. So give uh, the people live in the rural area the same thing they have in the city. So they want to come back. They want to stay there because the environment is better. The technology is the same, and it's better for the for the family. We will do several projects. Uh, follow the, the Lunan, Lunan group. Uh, the country paradise, this one is in Chongqing. We work about the community, is like uh, the community uh, have a possibility, the people and the tourists have the possibility to enjoy this project uh, in the different level. They go there like a tourist and then they enjoy the environment, uh, the agriculture, uh, the agri-tourism. They go there if they want, they buy the house. If they want, they enjoy all the events they have sometimes. This is another project in Nanjing. Uh, uh, we work uh, about uh, this area is an uh, agricultural area with uh, some village and uh, some uh, uh, water reservoir. Uh, we work about uh, the natural resources. Uh, and again, uh, is, uh, all this, this project is not far of the big city. Uh, you know, the big city, they don't have a good quality of the life, but they have a good quality of the service, but uh, the, the quality of the, the hair and the quality of the life, the food is not, uh, not very good. So we focus about to give uh, uh, a near place, near the city, uh, a, better, a better experience for, for, for the people and the family. Uh, this other project is another project uh, in uh, Jashin, uh, uh, is, is an area with a lot of water. They have a special agriculture, they have a, a long traditional uh, history, cult, culture history uh, about the paint and about uh, religion, they have a temple. Uh, so we work uh, to combine all the, the, the this area to give uh, uh, with the new technology, with the new technology of the agriculture, with the new technology of the, of the tourism, a new experience uh, to, the, to the people and the tourism over there. Uh, we have uh, some co cooperation. Uh, this uh, uh, Krausberry Farm is a farm in uh, uh, Canada and work with us uh, in China to uh, make a training for uh, the, the Country Paradise project and other uh, rural projects because they, they make uh, agri-tourism uh, based on the product. And uh, they work with the people and they work with the family and also they sell the product. 
Another cooperation is with the Underfood family farm, is another uh, farm, but this is in the USA, not far from LA. Uh, they focus more about the education. So they give a program, they, set, they, they, they make a program for the children and the family. It's one of the key points we want to use, uh, uh, we use it in our project. The key point uh, uh, is the family, is the future. We think. Uh, our project uh, need uh, all use all the tools we have technology and uh, new 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 agriculture everything uh, to give to the new generation a new experience and to tell them how it's possible to live in the future okay we 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 don't have the time to show the video the video is about the under the farm, what they what do inside, but I already said. This is one project, uh, again, in the, we go a little deeper in the detail of the project. Uh, this project we finish, uh, and we work in the, this year, in the last, last, uh, last few months, is for another uh, real estate company, also operation company, SUNEC. And the project is uh, Taoyan Town uh, is another uh, another big uh, challenge. Uh, they have a village, and uh, uh, we want to change. Uh, and we work with the local government. We soon have to change the the lifestyle in the village, and also to give uh, this village to a tourist, a potential tourist, to, to go there. Uh, the idea is to make something cool and fun. Uh, no far from the city. So we have different activity. You see what we do this, this last, uh, last month. So we do some uh, experience, some activity, the camping uh, uh, around uh, the farm and near the village. They have experience with, uh, uh, again, focus on the children with the animal and with the, 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 the crop, they, they try to, to uh, enjoy the rural life, but in the easy way. The rural life is not an easy life. We want to give to the tourism and to the, the, the user of our project uh, the easy way to enjoy the natural uh, uh, environment. Because we think the future is here. We, we need to think about a new a new environment and uh, take care of the environment. Uh, so we combine ecology, uh, vacation, art, uh, rural tourism with the program. Uh, we change uh, something uh, in the village. Uh, we improve the experience there. We training the people there. You see some image of the, the project, uh, the farm, uh, the forest camp, uh, the pandemic taste experience also with animal or with the crop. The second uh, topic we want to talk to today is about the, the smart tourism. The smart tourism for us uh, is another important uh, 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 project. Uh, we work uh, uh, about the two different projects uh, in the end uh, we, we show this. But, uh, what is the, the smart tourism? The other people today talk and they, 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 they uh, show a lot, a lot of simple about the, the tourism. The, the smart tourism is uh, uh, combined uh, the technology, the tool we have now with uh, the experience of the tourism uh, now. This is not very easy in, uh, in a lot of countries. I talk about uh, my country, my country, Italy. Italy has a lot of tourists there, but we are not able to do this kind of thing now because we need a lot of investment. The investment to make is not only to make the ATP, we need to be able to give data and to give the technology very easy to use, to combine the mobile phone and the, the um, but uh, we, we think it's a really good opportunity. In China, we are lucky because the, the government already invested in the uh, improved the technology. We have a lot uh, of plays with 5G, so it's very easy to use the big data, to use uh, a lot of uh, local, uh, a lot of uh, smartphone in the same time and give to the to the tourists a, a, a good opportunity. 
But we have some projects in Europe, uh, they already start to do this kind of thing. Helsinki, uh, the capital of Finland, uh, become the uh, European capital of smart tourists, and they work about this. Uh, they give uh, open data, uh, 600 uh, database, open and able for all the tourists go there to have more information about the city. And so to give an uh, uh, opportunity to go there and have uh, a, a real, uh, deeper experience with the city. Also, UK uh, is now not, uh, not anymore in, in, in Europe, but uh, Scotland they work about uh, a smart tourist program with the university. They make uh, some project uh, start with something they have, the Edinburgh, uh, the Edinburgh Festival, uh, Fiat Festival, one of the most important festivals in, in the world. But they have a problem. Uh, it's not easy to enjoy the different uh, uh, show there because they have a lot. So uh, the university and uh, the, the, the local tourist agency, they work together to give, uh, again, a tool uh, like a PT or information on the phone to enjoy a different uh, show and uh, very easy to make a schedule for, for the tourists there. Uh, also, uh, uh, they focus about uh, to make a, a personalization and uh, uh, to give a new channel for the, for the tourists to understand uh, the location and uh, to, uh, to give uh, to the, the, the tourists uh, some new experience, uh, to make uh, uh, something unique and easy to use. One another simple example uh, for for this is a bath, uh, the Roman bath in that uh, is an ancient uh, bath from the Roman emperor, and uh, the university, the, the, the Bristol University, make uh, some uh, work with also uh, BBC, and they have uh, uh, the, this kind of tool. You go there and with your smartphone or with uh, the uh, tablet, uh, you uh, come back uh, in the history and you see what is the path before. Barcelona also have a project in Spain uh, and uh, working uh, about uh, the data. Uh, in particular, they use uh, the, the bus station. Uh, in the bus station, they have uh, some beacon and uh, the, the beacon give uh, to the smartphone of the single people the information about uh, where is possible to go, uh, go or where is possible where they have the vision, when it's possible to catch the bicycle and this kind of thing. Uh, also, Australia and Brittany, uh, they use the uh, uh, beacon uh, technology to give uh, directly on the, the phone of the tourist uh, the information about everything, uh, restaurant, uh, exhibition, uh, event uh, in the city. In South Korea, the same. In uh, Amsterdam, in Ireland, also they give uh, the, the directly translation. So only not only give uh, the uh, the information, they catch some information from your phone. If you enjoy the TP, they understand what you need, and then they give to you the, the right uh, the right information. Um, what is the, the key point? The smart tourism uh, make uh, the tourism. Uh, active participant. It's not only uh, a spectator. It is someone that they work with, uh, with uh, uh, the people uh, or the local place to make the better experience. Uh, this is possible because now we have a new technology, VR, 5G, 6G, and uh, uh, big data uh, able for the smartphone and for the, the personal uh, device. Uh, all of this is possible because uh, and it's good uh, to improve the visitor experience, increase uh, the efficiency of the tourist destination, decrease the, the operation cost, uh, and uh, improve the marketing, improve uh, the demand forecast, uh, and create uh, new product and service. Uh, 
because all the data, all the tool uh, catch your need, and uh, uh, the visitor uh, have an uh, uh, on-site special experience. It's not only online, there they are more. The tourists, uh, also the change uh, 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 now and the change in the future, for sure, uh, the tourist film, the, the tourist film need to become smarter need to, to use more technology, we need to redefine the business. And we work about this uh, with MCM, uh, we show now some, some project. All of this uh, is to uh, uh, increase it to make better the experience. The experience before the visit, uh, the experience during the visit, and the experience often the visit. Uh, it's possible share in the real time, what you do, or what to do in some special place where it's not possible to go. Like uh, what I see before from some, some speaker, uh, it's possible, uh, again, I have experience with some places it's not possible to go now. Uh, the, the user become, uh, 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 they give the active information and become a creator of the experience. This is really important because in the in our world uh, now the people uh, become uh, more and more uh, think about a single experience, a special experience to share with the other, but they need a, a personal experience. It's possible, okay, open uh, they open a, a good opportunity for the virtual one uh, by one marketing. And it's possible to make a new, new travel experience. Metaverse is one of the uh, idea uh, of this. Create a new universe where uh, you have the reality of when you have uh, the, the information and when you, where you have a bit better experience and new destination. Uh, all the technology do this. Uh, in the end, I want to speak about uh, what uh, what we do in the last uh, few few years uh, and uh, uh, in MCM. We make uh, a, a smart village. A smart village is like uh, come from the idea of the smart city. In the smart village, we we make a project for build a platform. This, this platform uses technology uh, from the agriculture, from the tourists, for uh, everything uh, they need in the in the village, and uh, is able and uh, users for all the people live there and go there like a tourist. Also, we use a, a, a NTS technology uh, is a blockchain. Uh, technology with uh, a blockchain company, uh, MCM, uh, try to build uh, uh, a platform uh, to help uh, the, 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 the agency, the, the tourist uh, uh, agency, the, the hotel, uh, to give to the tourist an idea and uh, uh, to share the experience. The blockchain is a safe and loyalty technology. So uh, what they, they say, what they do, they become uh, uh, easy to understand and they trust what, uh, what they do. That's all for today. And uh, thank you. Please uh, uh, ask me any question if you need more. Uh, sorry if I go very fast, but the time is limited. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Francisco and uh, Miss Sherry for the sharing. It was something uh, different about uh, rural tourism and also smart tourism, something different and very interesting. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have already uh, come to an end of our session. Uh, is there any question and answers that you would like to ask the uh, speakers? I, I don't see any uh, Q&A. So, uh, if there's no uh, q and A, I I know it's, it's late, it's about 10, about 10, 10, 14 at night. Uh, we, we would like to share with you that our future events, uh, this Sunday we are launching the Singapore Industrial Attachment Training Program. This is for Malaysians who are interested to go to Singapore. And uh, we are also uh, having two other sessions. 
in uh, Sandakan that is in the island of Borneo. Uh, we are talking about nature tourism. And uh, on the 28th of November, we are having this uh, event, we call it Winning Tourism, the athletic way, where we call it Blowing the Bubble. So uh, these are our future events that are coming by. We have more, uh, by more coming in uh, in the later part of the week. And uh, we would like to thank all of you for attending the event and staying on. And uh, wish you all the best and stay safe. Uh, thank you very much. Before all of you go, uh, if we can have a group photo. Uh, I'm sorry because my camera is out, so uh, I, I'm not included into the photograph. Only my name is there. Uh, Haley, are you ready? Hello? Yes. We are ready. Okay. Haley? All right. One, two, three. Again, one, two, three. Okay, Hilly, thank you very much. Thank and you, uh, thank you, everyone. Good night. Stay safe. Good night. 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 Thank you.